So, Peter, I first interviewed you seven years ago, which feels like a different historical era, frankly. Quite a lot has happened since then. But I remember, I think I started that by asking your your views, kind of to sketch your opinions on the on the preeminent politicians at the time. That was still David Cameron and George Osborne. Let's start with Boris Johnson. I'm interested in your thoughts on his. We'll start with his moral character. <laughs> I, I don't think he claimed to have one. Uh, the thing about, I mean, I have met him a bit. When he was editor of The Spectator, we got together in a sort of prank against Michael Portillo, uh, which involved me uh, putting myself forward for the Conservative nomination for Kensington and Chelsea. It was fundamentally his idea. I played along with it, published a book. He was, uh, he, he was an enjoyable person to deal with. I find it... I wouldn't say impossible to dislike it, but I've never, I've never, I've never disliked him personally. And it's hard to disapprove morally of somebody who doesn't share your morals. I just don't think he does. So uh, I'm in almost all moral discussions. The, the, the older I get, the more I say my my main concern, my main moral concern, is about myself. Uh, the whole point of morality is not to tell other people what to do, but to get uh, get some kind of control over yourself and over the things that you oughtn't to do that you perhaps like doing too much. Um, so I'm not... I can't really get very exercised. In the way. I see a lot of people getting very exercised about, here we have a politician who's not honest. Uh, well, OK. But then, nor do I think was Blair honest over Iraq. And is that more or less important than Johnson's dishonesty? nor was Cameron honest over Libya, uh, one of the greatest catastrophes of foreign policy of modern times, and he gets a free pass over it. It, it wouldn't be my angle of attack. I mean, do you know I nearly was Boris Johnson? Explain. Well, I, there, was, there was a period in the 1990s when Have I Got News For You was quite rightly getting a lot of stick for being too left-wing. And so they were seeking a right-wing panelist. And I got a tryout, and he got a tryout. And the night I did it, the programme was more or less eaten by Clarissa Dixon Wright. Do you remember the two fat ladies? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, well, I won't go into it, but I made some perfectly serviceable jokes, one of which was stolen by one Anthony Wedgwood Ben. Outrageous behaviour. Uh, and one of which w wasn't stolen, and one of which was cut out by the makers of the programme. But I thought I did reasonably well, and it's a fantastic thing which happened in the weeks after I was on How I Got News For You, was that I, for a very short period, became a real minor celebrity. That is to say, people would stop me in the street all the time and say, so, so. it was astonishing. I'd never experienced anything remotely like it. And that was just from one appearance. Now imagine if they'd selected me instead of him, and I'd been on How I Got News For You as many times as he had, the celebrity power it would have given me. So, Peter, you could, you could now be asking Boris Johnson what he thought of my world. I have to say, I am now flitting between amusement, I have to say, I am amused, and mild rage, because obviously I don't subscribe to the great man view of history. I think grand social forces played a major role yeah, right. in determining how things happen. But if they had gone for you yes. over Boris Johnson, imagine he may never have become... All these things All these would, would things. not have happened no. because, it, I'm, in my view, everything that happened to So him basically, if was, you'd have told... Have I Got News For You created Boris Johnson as a national figure. If you told maybe just two more jokes, two more great jokes, that my the jokes political consequences... My jokes were fine. There was nothing well, wrong with my jokes. Well, it wasn't Peter. that. It was... It was, it was it, 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 you can look at it, you can watch the programme, you can see what happened. You should have ruffled your hair first. It wasn't... I mean, no, it wasn't... It was, it was, it was just that the, the, the Clarissa Dixon Wright was... <laughs> So she, she, she was determined to, to dominate the programme at, at all costs, ever, and, and that's what happened. One of the two fat ladies... Most of it had to be thrown away, because, it, well, it, 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 I think she's no longer with us now. But anyway, it was that close, is all I'm saying. It was like one of those John O'Hara novels in which somebody nearly becomes president of the United States. It could have been me. I, I am so lucky. Well, all I'm saying is, you can't libel the dead, so I'm going to say she played a very significant role in the destruction in the of this country. Of the history of the country, yes, she did. People don't realise. I, I think you could write a novel about it. One of those moments, the sliding doors moments, in which the whole history of everything, of everything, everything and everybody involved has changed. Based on an in overly... In this case, it was one fat lady. An overly boisterous performance by one fat lady. Yep. So, 
I guess what I very much take your point, by the way, in terms of often, you know, how we how politics is so trivialised. I get very angry when I bring up the war in Iraq when some people roll their eyes and go, oh, it's so far long away. And in 20 years' time, would people say if Putin, you know, oh, you know, the Ukraine war was 20 years ago, why are you still going on about it? Because it, it makes it sound like Arab lives don't matter, but... I still go on about the Franco-Prussian war, for goodness sake, and I wasn't even around. I mean, what they did to the Paris so It seems closer and closer as I get older. No. But the point, what depressed me about what you just said is how we shrug our shoulders and normalise dishonesty because it's so corrosive to democracy. Because if people don't trust their politicians... I'm not normalising dishonesty. I'm, I'm against it. But it, there are orders of magnitude. And the other thing in this, this whole business of the uh, of, 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 um, cake gate is that, for me, the offence was not in having a piece of cake or drinking some foul wine in Downing Street. The offence was in formulating regulations which prevented other people from doing so. That was the, that was the, that was the wicked action. The thing which infuriated me was government taking powers they should never have taken for reasons which didn't justify them. And the rest of it is, is trivial to me. And the, to getting angry about the fact that he didn't, break, he, he, he didn't keep regulations he had himself made is a waste of time. The question is, if, if, were the regulations justified in the first place? In my view, absolutely not. The whole thing was a terrible, disastrous mistake, like burning down your house to get rid of a wasp nest. And that's what he should be being excoriated for. But we disagree, obviously, on the approach to the pandemic, but that notwithstanding, surely you understand the rage of people who couldn't hold the hands of their dying relatives, watch their relatives well, buried on the Of course I understand. And the guy in but charge I, I of communicating the rules didn't abide by it. It's misdirected. They shouldn't be angry about him for having the cake. They should be angry about him for, for making the re angry about his making the regulations. Do you think if we hadn't had the regulations, the death toll stands at about 170,000? Do you think it would have been any lower? I think the evidence from Sweden suggests it would have been much the same. Why was it much higher in Sweden than its neighbouring countries? The uh, death toll. An interesting question, and I couldn't tell you. I, Sweden is perhaps more urbanised than the others. Um, I I don't know, but Sweden. Because the death toll is way more than all of them combined. Yeah, but I, wh why would you why would you make that comparison uh, and no other? If you compare Sweden with other advanced European countries instead of just with its Scandinavian neighbours, it more or less comes out roughly the same, if not slightly better. The main problem that Sweden had was 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 one which we had, was they completely messed up their care homes. Of course, and a total yeah. mess up. Care homes. That, that happened that, in Scotland as well. Swedish, Swedish care homes are bigger than British ones, and so the the. The, the, the death toll from it was bigger. I, I, that, that has something to do with it, but the, the, the narrowing it down to Scandinavian comparison obscures the, the most fundamental fact that a country which didn't do what we did didn't suffer consequences any worse than, than either we had or than most other comparable European countries do. We'll talk about COVID in a bit. Let's talk about Boris Johnson still. How, what is political character? What is the political will do slash philosophy of Boris Johnson? I don't think he has any politics. I simply don't think he has any political objectives. I, it's impossible to divine what they are. What, what does he believe in? He, I think he's one of these people who, 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 who pursues, who embr he, he embraces policies in order to pursue office, rather than pursuing office in order to implement policies. Why? What, what is, is there any evidence of a consistent belief system in anything he's ever said or done that you can see that I can't see any? It strikes me, though, with the Tory kind of trauma or tumult going on, that when David Cameron and George Osborne were dominant, the, they had an economically pro-austerity, what I call, an, you know, kind of authentic neoliberal roll back the state approach. But they were seen as being socially liberal. I would question that, given their policies and rhetoric and immigration, but that was how they were seen. Whilst the objection now for many on the right is you have a government which is far more socially conservative, that on the economy is more interventionist. And actually the objection well, lots of Tory MPs have at the moment is increasing corporation what way is, tax. is it more socially conservative? Well, what, deporting migrants to Rwanda? Well, one has to point out they haven't actually, as we sit here, deported anybody. No, they want to. Well, they want people to think they're going to deport people to Rwanda. What do you think about deporting migrants to Rwanda? I think it's probably impracticable. Um, and it's, 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 it, it may not be the ideal destination. Um, 
I don't think the, the, the idea of finding some way of deterring people from entering the country illegally is, is in itself wrong. Why didn't it work in Israel when they did the same thing? Why did it? Or didn't it didn't, it didn't I, work. I have no idea. I've never looked into it. I mean, the, the, the only country... Because I think it's immoral, but the it's only also country, well, yeah, Sure, but it's, it's different. But the only country which I think has made anything of this kind work at all, and even there I think it's been called into question, is Australia. But they have, uh, they have much, much wider seas between them and the, and, and the people who want to come to the country illegally. I mean, Prince Charles, I don't actually... But I, I don't, I mean, I, I think the, the, the purpose of it is not to send people to Rwanda. The purpose of it is to get people to stop going across the channel. Well, isn't... If they could do that without sending anyone to Rwanda, they'd be perfectly happy. I don't agree. I don't think that is the purpose. But, I don't, but you see, but that's, that's assuming that they, that they believe they can do it. No, but I, I think own, the... Purpose... I own, you see, you talked about David Cameron being conservative on immigration. He talks perpetually about bringing immigration down. I know he did. But he never actually did so. He said to tens of thousands. This is what conservatives do. They talk about bringing immigration down, but they don't actually do it. Isn't the part, point of the Rwanda scheme to basically cause outrage from people like myself and to get it blocked? It didn't get blocked by, by, the, uh, by obviously, the recent judgment, unfortunately. But isn't the point, actually, it, it's simply to appeal to a particular base who have very reactionary view on migrants and create political tension over the issue. Well, leaving aside whether their view is very reactionary, certainly I think it has a political purpose. And I'm reminded of the, you remember Theresa May's vans going around okay. North London with their posters saying everybody would be deported, which of course they weren't going to be. Go home. And that was aimed. That, that was aimed at the conservative voter base, rather than than at anybody who was actually illegally in the country. You probably couldn't have understood what was written on the vans anyway. So yes, I mean, you're you're, you're perfectly entitled to take a sceptical view of whether there's any real intent here. And I, you, you wouldn't necessarily find me disagreeing. I'm not a supporter of this government. I'm not a member of the Conservative Party. I don't have any reason to help it. The reason I'm surprised, you know, for, for me, in my lifetime, I've never had a government which in any way aligns to my political views. And I kind of resent you a bit because I think to myself, come on, Peter, you've got something so close, surely. To your own worldview, and you're still grumpy about it. You've got, I have, you've got, it's a, it's you've, it's nothing that this government does, an, it, does or says or has why? any what? resemblance to anything that I that I I desire. What's your first big objection to this government? What, what is it about as as someone like yourself? I'd say you know, a, a social conservative, small C, who hates the Conservative Party, but but why? What about this government do you fundamentally object to? All governments, particularly since 1997, have accepted as a fait accompli the social and cultural revolution. In what way is this government accepting that revolution? Well, it's, it, 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 it implements particularly the, 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 the keystone piece of legislation, which, which is the Equality Act of 2010. What's your There's objection a, to that? Well, I don't, I, I, I don't actually... Uh, accept its categories as being the correct categories, nor do, I, nor do I believe that equality and diversity should be the governing principle of the country. Do you think this government talks about diversity a lot? I don't, I don't, I don't it see does. it. does. In, in, in what it does, it does. If, you, the, the, if, you, if, if an actually conservative government, in, in the technical sense rather than in the, 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 the title sense, came into being, it would have so many tasks. The most fundamental thing that has happened in this country really since the 1950s uh, has been, first of all, the, the withdrawal of support by the state for the married family. And secondly, the acceptance by the state of the idea that there is no ultimate moral right and wrong and that you, you therefore can no longer deter or punish wrongdoing. Those two things together have transformed the country completely. And they were achieved over a period of 20, 25 years by Labour and Conservative governments. In what sense? Well, uh, first of all, the, the key piece of legislation on the family has to be the Harold Wilson Divorce Law Reform Act of 1968-69. The penal and 
criminal justice reforms of Roy Jenkins similarly remove the principle of punishment from the criminal justice system and also dismantle the police as a preventive organization designed to prevent crime. So those are two, those are two key moments. But we have far more people in prison now than we did in the 90s. Yes, we do, and it's fascinating. And that, but that's, that's just a demonstration of how practically ineffective the policy is that they adopted. We now use prisons as a, as a final resort uh, when we've, most people who, who go to prison, unless they're homicides, will probably have committed something like 30 crimes before they ever get there. Many of those crimes not even noticed or prosecuted by the authorities. Then subject to cautions, uh, to fines which went unpaid, to suspended sentences, to community service orders. And only when, by the time people have actually become habitual criminals, they actually get sent to prison. Look at, look at uh, read reports from magistrates' courts and see what, the, what, see what the magistrates and the district judges are saying to the people they're sending to prison, or more often not sending to prison. It's a, the, the pressure on the judiciary not to send people to prison is huge. But what we have is an irreducible minimum of incompetent criminals who get caught and who ha have such long records that they have to send them to prison. That's what the prisons do now. Whereas, if prison was the experience as it used to be before this, of that came to you on a second offence, which used to be the, the, the first offence people would, unless it was very serious, the courts would usually be lenient. But if you came on a second offence, and usually it would be prison, it acted as a deterrent. And if you look at prison population, not just in raw numbers, but per capita during the post-war period, it's the time after the criminal justice system goes soft and begins making excuses for, for criminals that the, the numbers of people in prison go up. So that, that is a paradox, which, like all paradoxes, is easily explained if you look, but most people don't look. Well, just t t two things. I mean, you asked me, so I'm telling no, 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 you. No. I, I wrote a whole book about this no, some years ago. I mean, so so long ago that I'm now beginning to forget bits of it, but that bit I cannot forget. I mean, the statistics show that people in prison are disproportionately people with some form of mental illness. They have most male prisoners one or two personality disorders. They're people often from deprived backgrounds who've been, sure. who've been abused, gone through very trauma. Quite so. So is it not the case that our justice system is essentially locking up mentally ill poor people who've oh, been the, failed? The, 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 there are a lot of mentally ill people in prison who ought to be in mental hospitals and would be if we still had the mental hospitals that Enoch Powell very stupidly closed down. Uh, it's amazing how Enoch Powell is, is, is rightly loathed for his... Uh, for his um, rivers of blood speech, but his, in many ways, much worse action of closing down residential mental health provision in this country is forgotten. And an awful lot of people end up, the police are heavily burdened with dealing with them, the prisons contain them. It's, if you visit a prison, which I expect you have done, the, the, probably the most tragic part of the prison you'll see is the bit where the mentally ill people are. There's, it's totally the wrong place for them. But the, in the end, the state has nowhere else to put them because it's dismantled the other provision it ought to have. That is true. Uh, deprivation takes more than one form. Of course, it's true that uh, that, that people who are, um, who come from the, the 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 more deprived part of society disproportionately end up in prison. But that isn't necessarily because of material poverty. It's because of the dismantling of uh, of authority, both in the home, uh, increasingly in the schools and also on the streets, uh, which allows people who go wrong to go wronger and wrong and wrong. And it's, it's the, if the middle class family breaks down, then generally, you know, there are two comfortable homes, there are seriously organized arrangements for the children to be looked after. If a poor family breaks down, uh, there are serial boyfriends in the house, many of whom don't like the existing children. Uh, there is chaos. Uh, there is an almost total absence of responsible examples uh, or authority figures. Before I ask you about the family. So you would get that. that so it's not surprising that you would find most crime among the deprived. It's perfectly possible to be poor and to be well behaved. And many, many millions of people throughout history. You look at this country during the 20s and 30s, the poor people of this country living in circumstances of deprivation we would find unimaginable almost totally uh, free of crime. Before I ask you about the family and marriage again, because I, mean, I am interested in that, why do you think in Norway, who has a justice system based, which has a justice system very much based on rehabilitation, where sentences are shorter, and where prisons 
I'll be honest with you, a kind of as far as the mail or the daily the, the mail on Sunday begins, so it would be this, you know, outrageous idyllic settings and surroundings. Why is their reoffending rate? so much lower I don't know. than that of Britain. I've never looked into it. I mean, it may but be do you not think that would be, be an interesting it, point for you to consider, what, given... It may be that it's quite difficult to find out a lot of this stuff, and you have, I haven't had the time to do it. It may be that in Norway, um, being a much smaller society, in which I would imagine it's much harder to get away with crime without people knowing, that they get them earlier on. I don't know. But it's just I because they have I can't, a... I can't talk about it because I don't know. Which is, the US has a high reoffending rate and a high crime rate, but a very punitive justice system. Norway, a, 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 the opposite form of justice system in a low I don't, I don't compare this country with, with, with other countries with totally different social structures. In the United States, I think we, we have to accept it's a very different country from yes. this country. And, and indeed, the south of the USA is a very different country from the north. It is. Uh, and and west from east. Are very different. No, the north and the south is the true, biggest yeah. difference. But I compare this country now with this country as it was. When and I think that demonstrable changes took place which followed legislative and cultural change. You, you wrote about marriage. By killing lifelong marriage, we are killing children. Liberal Britain cannot see this, but until somebody does, the tragedies will continue. Now, I understand very much your critique of the collapse of what's sometimes described as the traditional family, of marriage as a central institution, pillar of society. But, I mean, isn't it just the case that what we know as marriage, the institution of marriage, all, rel all the forms that relationships take has drastically changed throughout the ages. We didn't used to have romantic love. It used to, people would be partnered up, uh, not on the basis of falling in love with each other. It would be based on, on other things. Women in the institution of marriage traditionally were enslaved. They were imprisoned. They were the chattel of their husband. So, you know, the, the institution of marriage in the 14th century or the 18th century are very different from the 20th century. It's just the case, isn't it, that throughout the ages, the forms that relationships take just drastically change. It's barking at thunder to try and suggest you can sort of force people back into an institution that evolves so drastically all the time. Some changes happen as, as a result of things which can't be controlled or altered. Uh, some things happen, you know, and the whole nature of society alters from a, a rural peasant society to an industrial you know, urban society to all kinds of things, which all kinds of things change. Other things change as a result of legislative decision. It may be that um, I don't, I don't have any. I, I'm not a propagandist for the past. I don't say that everything that happened in the past is better than what happened in the present. I say that the, the principal activity of anybody with any influence over events is choosing the future. And I'm saying that in the period when we undermined marriage, particularly in the 1960s, we chose the wrong future and we pay for it all the time. I, it, the, it, the, the society which existed before the 1968 Act was not all that different from the society we have now. But the principal difference between the two, uh, one of the principal differences between the two, is the fact that marriage is, is, is now so easily dissoluble. Isn't that simple? I mean, if two people... It didn't have to happen. But if two people no longer love each other, they, they need to... I mean, look, the Children's Society did a study which suggested no, that... No, no, just quickly, divorce isn't permission to separate. Divorce is permission to remarry. Right. Yeah. Two completely different things. <laughs> People, if people don't wish to stay together, then, then no law is ever going to force them to stay together. But if you make marriage a state of life with considerable privileges and responsibilities, something which you can do serially and which you, the, the, the principal promise which the contracting parties make is broken, then you change the nature of the society in which it exists. And there's no other area of law in which this is the case. If you, if you don't pay for some, if you buy a new computer and you don't pay for it, uh, the person who sold it to you will come after you eventually, if you won't pay, in, in the county court. And because you have broken your side of the contract to pay the bill, the court will side with the guy who sold you the computer and make you pay. But isn't that different because if you're... Wait a minute, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you break a marriage, then the court will side with the person who breaks the contract. 
Yeah, but the difference between if you buy a computer and you don't pay for it is you're imposing a financial penalty for which someone else suffers because they have burdened the cost. No, of I'm just talking about the enforcement of promise. No, I know, of course, but it's different, though, isn't it? Because what <laughs> harm has done to... Purposes, one of the purposes of law is to enforce promise. Sure. People should be able to, to keep promises, but sometimes they don't. And if they don't, the law is there to reinforce the promise. But, I mean, in the, It's a unique feature of law uh -huh. that the, the, the promise of marriage uh, is one which the courts will not back. It, but it's surely In fact, just, well, they will actively side with the promise breaker against the promise keeper. But it's an unrealistic absurdity, surely, to presume that you could ever treat whatever the marriage vow says. I understand. I've been to many weddings. I know what the marriage. I know how the vows go. It's a ludicrous fantasy to think that anybody could really promise, regardless of circumstances, that they will never part from the person that they have pledged to marry. Uh, in 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years. Well, That's just an absurdity. I can only reply, that is your opinion. And this is not mine. I want to talk about Keir Starmer. Now, you said, you said he belonged to a Marxist faction. It's true, he was part of a left-wing collective. Uh, but so were you, you've changed. <laughs> obsessed, so, yeah. obsessed with green politics and sexual revolution, well into his adulthood, and has never said he was wrong. And he will now be surprised, and you talked about there'll be this potential for permanent revolution, uh, majority for the hard left. Now, let me just put this, make this very clear. Someone who's on the radical left. Keir Starmer stood for the Labour leadership on, we talked about deceit and dis, we talked about dishonesty. He stood on a platform, essentially of Corbynism without Corbyn, of radical domestic policies, of party unity, and he completely reversed all of those things. So your nightmare, which you've painted, of Keir Starmer leading some left-wing radical government, I would just very politely put to you, is not going to happen. Well, that depends on what you think a radical left-wing government looks like. I, I think the Blair government was a radical left-wing government. I think the Blair government was the most radical government this country's had since Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> and you don't. Well, no, I mean, well, you I... You don't, because in my view, still you're, you're, view you're, you're unobservant and untutored in the ways of revolution. And I am observant and I am tutored in the ways of revolution. I know how it's done. I just think you would have noticed the revolution in the Cromwell's time the and people didn't. About, the whole point about modern revolution is that it is half of its point is that it's not noticeable. Right. It's the Kierkegaardian revolution where all the buildings remain standing but all the ideas change. Can it truly be a revolution if people don't really notice it? Yes. I just think under Cromwell well, people really did notice it. Most effective revolutions. Well, yes, but Cromwell had a very large army to make sure that people did That's what I mean. You don't, people don't want to do this anymore. What the... Well, this is all, it's again, you're so young. It, I'm not, the, though, what you, you weren't alive in 1968. I wasn't, though, that's true. What idealistic revolutionaries saw in 1968 was tanks. They saw what they had reluctant, increasingly reluctantly viewed as their side, enforcing its will with tanks on the people of Czechoslovakia. And they were horrified. My dad was in Czechoslovakia when that happened. Well, there you are then. And I, bet he, I, bet, I bet he was horrified. He was horrified. He was a Trotskyist. And what, the, and what the, the intelligent left began at that point to do was to, was to rethink on a grand scale. I mean, there'd already been Trotskyists. I mean, I, you know, I was a Trotskyist in the year, but, it, but it went, it, it, what happened was that to the, the mainstream communists, the, the European Social Democrats and the European communists, particularly the Italians, we can't carry on like this. This is not a... The, the, no one will ever support uh, a movement which imposes its will by force with tanks. Uh, the Soviet experiment has been a disastrous failure, and yet we still wish to transform society. How do we do it? And that's why that when they began in large numbers to turn to Antonio Gramsci and his, his completely different theory of how you revolution. Michael Gove quotes him quite a lot. Of course he does, yes. At the, but on that, look, listen. New Labour, well, except... The interesting thing about Michael Gove is which side is he on in this revolution? Well, that is an interesting question. Well, very interesting question. Um, what New Labour did is accept the fundamental underpinnings of Thatcherism. The privatised utilities remained privatised. The anti-trade union laws largely remained in place. The ta top tax rate stayed the same. They, cut, tax corporation, rates, they, cu they, cu they cut They cut. They cut. They cut corporation tax time and time again. Fundamentally, they accepted the free market capitalist settlement, but merely tried to humanize it. That's not well, a revolution. So, so did Deng Xiaoping, roughly the same time, to get rich is glorious. Yeah, but he didn't... They weren't bothered. The, 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 the realization among, among intelligent Marxists that attacking people for having money was a futile waste of time. But that's kind of... It's, not, it's, it's all part of the, of the, 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 the revision 
which took place after 68. It's not Marxism anymore. If you accept a large capitalist class well, and even encourage them, how is it Marxism? When did you last read the, the Communist Manifesto of 1848? I've read it several times. It well, ignores it's an absolute, capitalism what originally. What it is, it's, it's fundamentally, it's the, as, as, as was the Paris Commune, which also got Marx into ecstasies, it's fundamentally a rerun of the 1789-93 French Revolution. It's a Jacobin document. It's much more about the, 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 the reordering of, of, of human existence than it is about economic seizure of power. But the whole point... It is, this, is what, this, is, this is the revolutionary roots of, of, of all left-wing movements. Uh, 18th century France, not 20th century Russia. And, it's, and the, the, the 1968 took revolutionaries, intelligent revolutionaries, back to 18th century France. Yeah, but the, the point about what Marx is... Notice something, I mean, for instance, the, the, the very vigorous attack on Christianity, yeah, but, which the left has been making in, in, in recent years. It comes from the same thing. Was a, he was a devout Christian. Well... <laughs> but just on that, look, I mean, what Marxism argued was, capitalism, you know this, used to be a Trotskyist, created a proletariat which was the would become the gravedigger of capitalism, um, and by overthrowing the bourgeoisie, what the proletariat would do the, is, is eliminate all class also distinctions. Also, by the 1960s, but that's, everybody else. But that's everybody, not what Blairism did. Everybody knew that was wrong too. The the, the the attempts to find a substitute for the proletariat, for instance, in the Third World, the Franz Fanon view, all that, the, 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 all that was also going on because the proletariat had stopped being a proletariat. The, Can, proletariat, the, the, the proletariat let down the the, the 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 vanguard party, and they needed to replace it with something else. That wasn't going to happen. Proletarian revolution was an Edwardian diversion. What genuine threat? Because you're you're what you said. You said you don't like Johnson. In fact, you think he's terrible. But you you were reluctant to join in attacks upon him because you think things could get significantly worse. No, I didn't say that. I, you, I, you said it because things could be a lot worse. I'm reading your own writing here, by the way. I'm just reading about your column. What the, what what you you're arguing that Keir Starmer's government will essentially be this hard left revolutionary government. And I suppose my question is... We already have a hard left revolutionary government. Do we now? Yes. Do we? In my view, yes. How? Why well, is it hard I left? Look around. I just see the, the, the continued destruction of the married family. How are they uh, destroying the marriage family? Well, Boris Johnson's destroyed the marriage family personally. Egalitarian, egalitarian uh, comprehensive education. Uh, the, the, uh, like, they want to reopen grammars. Well, they're throwing that so as red meat. No, I'm telling you what, it, you know, what it looks like to me. Um, a, a, a foreign policy of, um, of, of liberal interventionism rather than national defense, uh, a, a, a rapidly accelerating um, dismantling of the country itself, uh, the, the acceptance of constitutional reforms which are fundamentally of the... What of constitutional the reforms? Well, the, the main constitutional reforms of recent years were those, again, in the, in, during the Blair Revolution, of the, the, the breakup of the country. You want the breakup of the country, you want English independence. I, now I do, because, uh, because I recognise the country has broken up. But you ha it hasn't broken up. Well, it's it still, it's still, it's it's still, still intact. It's still, there's still a few, few bits of news. It's held together with post-it notes. There's nothing. There's nothing. The, the, the thing has no real continuity. Do you think Just, Wales it, it is, will is go, It will go. Yeah, but uh, are we, it, I find it, this interesting thing because at the time. I mean, I'm trying to explain to you what it is, how it is that I, how it is that I see this. Some of the highest levels of, 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 of taxation uh, ever seen in this country now exists as well. The, the, the interference in people's private life at an unprecedented level. I don't think that this is a. It, it, it would be wrong to call this a country run by what I would regard as far as. Interference in private life. I mean, given your views on marriage, I'm surprised at that because you do want interference in people's private life, surely. No, I, I, want, I want people to be allowed to. What, what the government has done is, is actively weakened the institution of marriage. It's actively weakened parental authority. It's actively weakened at the same time, say, the authority of teachers over pupils, as they're no longer called. Uh, it's done all kinds of things of that kind, which have uh, which have actually had the the paradoxical effect of strengthening the power of the state. Can, can the I family ask? being the principal rival of the state uh, in terms of power and influence over people. So I've got I, that was my fault. I, I did a segue back to marriage. I mean, what, you're not proposing that the government would just overturn devolution. I mean, that would cause a, probably I'm a not civil war. Anything. I, I, I have no program. I keep trying to explain this to people. I, I, I just sit and laugh. I have no. You become a nihilist. No, I just, I, I, I just know that I have no, um, no chance of influencing political development. Why do you want English independence? 
Why not? Because it's just the left is often accused of wanting why, to destroy the country. Why, why sit around waiting? Why sit around waiting? Uh, no, to, to, no, so so, so, so all, your, all, all the, the other parts of the United Kingdom are sliced off. Why sit around? It's okay, right. If that's what you want, have it. But it's just to take, I mean, I support you. I, mean, I, I don't believe in sitting around wait, waiting to have, 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 have chamber pots emptied over my head by other people. I, if, if, if they want us to go, then let us get up and go. Of our own free will. That's all. I don't see. I see any 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 reason to sit around waiting for the further humiliations Let to be heaped upon us by by Nicola Sturgeon and who are, and not to mention Sinn Fein. Well, United Ireland is looking closer than ever. You're absolutely right. Let's talk I'm about it for years. Let's talk about Ukraine now. I'm someone who would describe myself as being from the anti-war left. I regard the Iraq War as the greatest crime of our time. Hundreds of thousands of people slaughtered based on. A pack of lies, uh, including obviously several British service personnel, but t t hundreds of thousands of Iraqi civilians. Libya, another absolute catastrophe based on a lie, as you've just pointed out. My view on what's happened in Ukraine is a kleptocratic Russian revanchist chauvinist government, which is not inspired by the Soviet Union, actually very much against, is essentially a kind of neo-Tsarist, Russia, greater Russian, blood and soil Russian nationalist project has, without any provocation whatsoever, invaded an independent country which democratically elected its president and unleashed a barbaric war, including laying to waste entire cities and slaughtering innocent civilians. Surely that is how we should see the war and therefore as one for the anti-war left, I would support arming Ukraine in that war of national self-defense so that the inevitable peace settlement, which I support, is as much on the terms of Ukraine as possible. This is one of those moments very common in modern Britain where knowing anything about the subject is a profound disadvantage. In what sense? Well, I mean, I, I knew where Ukraine was before six weeks ago start. I've okay. been there sure. for another thing. I know some history of it for another. Um, and the, 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 the key, uh, how shall I put it, error in what you just said was the, was the phrase without provocation. Now, even Robert Kagan, you know who Robert Kagan is? Explain though for the viewers. Well, he's the husband of Victoria Newland, who is in charge of the United States Ukraine policy. He's a well-known a neoconservative thinker, wrote recently in Foreign Affairs magazine that of course there had been provocation in Russia. Uh, in this he joined all kinds of people from Henry Kissinger to John Mearsheimer uh, to many, many others in diplomacy and politics over the past many years who've said that the westward expansion of NATO was a grave mistake and would cause problems. Now, to say that something was provoked is not to say that that something was either good or wise, but to pretend that it wasn't provoked is absurd. The other thing is, there's a great inquiry going on in Washington DC at the moment about the events of January 2021, in which a bunch of violent oafs tried to seize the US Capitol. And quite right too, it's a disgraceful episode. It needs to be investigated and exposed. But it seems to me that an equal amount of scrutiny should be aimed at the, at the violent mob putsch, which unlike the January 2021 events was successful in Kiev in February of 2014, when the legitimately elected president of Ukraine was overthrown by a violent mob with the backing of the United States. Do you not think following whatever we think about the so-called maiden revolution, there was a free and fair election after that, and there have been free and fair elections well, in the UK since. Because I mean, Zelensky won over 71%, I, it, it, and he wasn't... Let, let's stick to... Let's, Zelensky is the second person to have been elected since that event. The first, as you remember, was Petro Poroshenko. And he was the more... He was the, but, he was the less but, but aggressive wait a minute, But let's go back to... Instead of changing the... So let's go back to the initial point. First of all, uh, the, there's, there's no question. You're, you know, the, the newspaper with which you're principally associated, The Guardian, reported in 2010 that there was no question that Yanukovych had been fairly elected. I, I don't dispute that. Good, right. And so he, just dispute. so people know, he's more pro-Russian, that's just so everyone Well, knows. that's that's one way of looking at it, that I don't think you'd find the Russians would agree that the way he screwed them over Sevastopol and gas prices was particularly pro-Russian. 
Uh, it's a characterization made of him by, by outsiders who know little of Ukrainian politics. Fair enough. Uh, he was ultimately pro-Ukrainian, but his, his constituency tended to be among the, the Russian speakers of the East rather than yeah. the, 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 how should I say, the, the different part of Ukraine that lies to the West. Yeah. Uh, and his party tended to go to support from there. But that's another, so we, what we have first of all settled on is he was legitimately elected. Secondly, we have to accept that he was not lawfully removed from office. Do you know what happened? I mean, you know the visit by the, the foreign ministers of, of Poland, and France and Germany to attempt to get the Ukrainian opposition to achieve a compromise on February 21st and, and 22nd of 2014. And the deal which they came up with in which Yanukovych offered uh, and, and agreed to early elections, constitutional change. Do you know about this document? Yeah, tell me more. Well, I, can't, I haven't got it with me, but it's, uh, if you want a, the complete story, uh, Richard Sackler's excellent book, Frontline Ukraine, gives the whole story and indeed the details of the document. Among those who present was, was for instance, Radek Sikorsky. Uh, but it was, a, it was a, a, a very heavyweight delegation of very senior European political and diplomatic figures, and they came up with this. And the supposed moderates among the Ukrainian opposition, speaking for the Maidan, who were supposed to sell this deal, took it to the Maidan and were told by the mob leaders uh, that they were not accepting it, that Yanukovych must go. And if he did not go, they would take arms and march on his house. Uh, the, shortly after that, as Sakwa describes it, the, what remained of the security forces in central Kiev disappeared. Uh, and Yanukovych, having a pretty good idea of what might happen to him if he stuck around, left. There was then a supposed impeachment procedure in Kiev in the days afterwards in which they couldn't actually raise enough votes uh, to fulfill the conditions of the impeachment law. And during which, this is another crucial fact, there were armed men in the debating chamber of the Ukrainian Rally, the Ukrainian parliament. This was a putsch. And one of the people who says so is Jack Matlock, who was Ronald Reagan's ambassador to Moscow, a very senior American diplomat. He says it was a putsch. I very much agree with him. I think that it, 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 it has all the characteristics of putsch violence, uh, the overthrow of a, legitimate, of, 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 a, of a legitimate government, and its replacement by an illegitimate government without, without, so, without lawful or constitutional so procedure. Just, just That's a putsch. Just and it was also backed, as we know, for, you, you, you know about the, the bleep the EU tape. The, 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 what was the last part? Bleep the EU. Uh, bleep. Bleep, well, I'm being polite. Oh, sorry, bleep as in F U C K. Yes, as in Victoria sure. Newland's um, conversation sure. with the American ambassador to Ukraine, which she, if she was discussing uh, in great detail the kind of government which the United States wanted in Kiev, which was different from the one which it had. There's no question there was American involvement in this. And so this was the, and it also, it, 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 it involved considerable violence. There's a it's great dispute. And this is not idle. Uh, serious academics have not been able to come up with a clear idea of what great dispute who is responsible. Beyond doubt, significant numbers of police officers defending the government were shot dead during this. The opening shots in the Ukrainian war were not fired when the when the Russians mounted their barbaric and stupid invasion. They were fired during the putsch in February 2014, and immediately war began a very very well, serious east, a, very, se a very yeah, serious war in which i have to say ukrainians behave very badly towards russian speaking civilians no, and, no, no, and, i mean in fact, i wrote, I wrote about how human rights are and i'm actually actually detail this, this about war, this war, this, this, but just just this, look, this, look, look peter you, you cited how this you, war is eight years old it's not new know, you, you you cited henry so provocation I, I, I get, there is provocation henry kissinger you cited for example I did, yeah. and the reason you, you cited him because he's associated often with the hawkish foreign policy but henry kissinger who's a war criminal is is you know, he's the exemplar of real politique. And his objection is, his fear is, the main rival to US power is China, and he's fearful of Russia and China well together the block. The point I'd make to you, this whole point about provocation, this, you know, Mir Sharma, is it Mir Sharma? Mir yes, Sharma, yes, Now, the yeah. argument is, is the same, which is basically to well, Latin America. You say he's a war criminal. No, I'm not saying he's okay, definitely right, not a okay. war criminal, just, just sure avoid being sued by Mir Sharma for no reason. No, he's not, no. Henry Kissinger is a war criminal. Um, 
No, the, 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 the argument there basically is this. If you have the bad lot... Is Noam Chomsky walking around? No, no. Because it's the one thing... I don't think... It's the one thing I, no, about... It's the one Peter, thing on the I planet I about which... Noam Chomsky, about Noam Chomsky and Chomsky. Henry Kissinger agree. No, no. They both agree... I'm saying Henry Kissinger... ...that the NATO was a provocation. Yeah, sorry, Peter. I'm saying... I'm, yeah, saying I'm, just, Henry I'm just getting this straight. I'm saying Henry Kissinger's a war criminal because he carpet bombed Southeast Asia. That's why I'm calling him a war yeah, okay, criminal. I'm, I'm, but it's just not, to be absolutely clear, it's not clear really about relevant that. to the point. Just to be very it? clear. Well, well, the, the, the argument, this real, the realist kind of perspective here, is if you have the mis- not realist, no, listen, listen. Actually, if you've got the misfortune to live next to a great power, bad luck, mate. But you're going to have to play a smart game, or you're going to get provoked by them. So an example of that would be this, Chile, 1973, ele- they, they had a left-wing president, Salvador Allende, Henry Kissinger himself said, I do not see why we have to let a country go communist because of the irresponsibility of their own people. My parents took in Chilean refugees who fled Pinochet's regime. Now, Chile had the right to determine its own future. Just because it happens to be near a great power, it didn't like in their backyard. Hang on, hang on, no, the point I'm making is the same no, thing. I, I, I know. Ukraine, it's not the same thing. But Ukraine has elected freely and fairly. No, it freely no. and fairly. You said, no, you said, you said, you said no, I, I'm, on, arguing, on I, I'm arguing very narrowly right. that, that, that you said that it was without provocation. But do you think electing Allende was a provocation to the United States? I, hang on a minute. You said that I'm, 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 I'm sticking to one subject. I lose the same though. I'm asking you Generally, is people who are losing the argument change the subject. I'm not changing the well, subject. Well, then don't I'm, change I'm extend- the subject. I'm extending Here your logic. Here is my simple point. I've extended which, your logic. Which, in, which I, in, in, in which I have challenged your initial presentation. That you said it was without provocation. And I say it was not without provocation. I don't think that... Absolutely. Um, there wasn't an attack. There was provoked. no attack on Russia. Russia was not attacked by anyone in Ukraine. There's well, been you no don't have to, there was no attack on. There was no attack on um, Russian soil. Wait a minute. You, provocation, and, I, and again, you need to read Robert Kagan on this. Doesn't necessitate an attack. Uh, Kagan also listed, which I wouldn't have had the nerve to do because I'm not an American. He listed uh, Roosevelt's maneuvering of Japan right. uh, in, in, into attacking the United States in 1941 as a provocation. Of course, he also listed, as I think anybody who knows any history does. Uh, Bismarck's manoeuvring of Napoleon III into war in 1870 with the Ems Telegram. And the, 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 it, is, it is not unknown for countries to manoeuvre other countries into being the aggressor. No, but the point I'm making by is... By provocation. There is no need and, on and, any grounds of self-defence for Russia is to not on, Kagan is absolutely no, not on my right? side in this matter. But he is, on the other hand, an informed... Yeah. An but, intelligent person with, with, the, with, as we know, extremely high contacts with the, the United I'm, States government. Po- and he says sure. that Russia was provoked. I, yeah, and it's, he, he's, he's, uh, it's absurd to say it he's, wasn't He's provoked. entitled to his opinion. Thank you. I, I'm, point, sure he's, I'm sure he's glad the, you think so. The, the point, but I'm not, I'm not trying to make no, 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 out... I'm no, not but, trying to raise this because he's entitled to his opinion. No, to, it just seems, if we can't accept... No, it just seems like an appeal to authority. If that's the point. And that's a logical fallacy, Peter. If there's a serious argument among people who hate Russia... Sure. There's a serious argument that there was provocation in this. Then I think you have to accept it's quite likely I, that there I, was. I think that's an appeal to authority, which is a logical fallacy. The okay. point, the argument I'm saying, not, not, the, not the, axiomatically. The point I'm just being, just to be, be very annoying. clear. I don't see how they can be. It can be deemed to be a provocation, which obviously leads to a war. You oppose, by the way. It's very, very important to make that clear. But unless a country is attacked by another country, unless its citizens are attacked, its military personnel, its soil, it cannot justly claim to have been legitimately provoked into any form of armed action, and therefore no legitimate provocation took took place, which justifies a war which has killed tens of thousands of people already, including working class Russians who've been lobbed into this horrendous war and ripped from their families at the age of 19. I don't agree. I mean, it's a very interesting doctrine, but I don't agree. And I think that you can, it's perfectly possible to provoke uh, countries without, um, without actually attacking them. And indeed, it's, uh, it, it can be a very useful tactic in war, as, as, uh, as, as Kagan pointed out. And the provocation has been a very long one. I, the other person who I've waited till this point to mention here is George Kennan. The inventor of the of the whole diplomatic strategy of containment of the Soviet Union, who came out of retirement, I know, uh, to warn against NATO expansion on exactly these grounds. It's, there's no shortage of people. Putin himself, in his speech at the Munich Security Conference, said, "What is all this for?" And the the, the response the year afterwards at the NATO Bucharest Conference to Putin saying, "Why are you doing this?" It was not, "Oh well, let's consider this," but an offer heavily sponsored by that genius of military and diplomatic 
uh, strategy of George W. Bush and offer to Ukraine and Georgia that they should they should become members of NATO. Very strongly, I have to say, against the advice of many European Union leaders who thought this was an act of folly and indeed provocation. And so it turned out this was not an unpredictable crisis. This is a crisis that's been predicted since, say, George Kennan yeah, began but, to warn against it but the thing is, back so, in 1998. I, I, don't, I don't support NATO. If there was a referendum in this country, I'd vote to leave NATO. So just to be absolutely clear about my own position and credentials on that issue. The point I would put to you is this. There isn't going to be no, one. No, 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 no. I, think this is an, I, I want you to engage with this point because I think it's an important point. No. Well, let me just put it to you and then you can decide whether to engage with it. From my perspective, Western power, Western imperialism is responsible for the greatest global crimes. The Iraq being most notable recently, I could go back to Vietnam, Henry Kissinger, we keep citing, uh, whether it be obviously you could cite Libya, you know, so many catastrophes which have decimated the you lives. in Syria, I noticed. Sy well, okay, we could talk also about Western involvement in Syria, but we're going to get distracted. So the point I'm making about Eastern Europe is their perspective is this, look, yeah, they might say you're absolutely right about Iraq and elsewhere, but our history is one of Russian domination and fear of, of Russian power. And they would be able to cite over many centuries subjugation by Russia in various incarnations, and that's what they fear the most. Is, and the reason they've been driven into the arms of NATO is a legitimate fear of Russian before, expansionism. Before 1991, when was Ukraine an independent nation? But you could say this about no, I'm not asking a question. Before 1991, when was Ukraine in the nation? Well, but briefly after the brest litovsk No, there it was. It was, a, it was just, just a, a German puppet. It was 1918. It was a, for, German, it was a, German, was a civil it was, war. It was a German puppet in 1918. Fine. Was when was Ukraine last in the Well, Kurdistan's never been an independent country, but I see Kurdistan as a nation. Do you I'm think Kurdistan's that, a nation? But I haven't said it isn't a nation. I'm saying that Ukraine's independence in its current form yeah. dates from 1991. Yeah. How was it obtained? Through a referendum, in exactly, which people, through a referendum, in which overwhelmingly no, no, people yeah, voted for independence. I know this. No, don't treat me as if I don't know. Not, it was I'm obtained. Not. It was obtained through a referendum. Did Russia uh, offer any resistance to the outcome of that referendum, or prevent Ukraine from from, well, the, from a previous? Did Russia prevent well, the previous administration? Did, no, it's no, a different no, administration. No, did Russia prevent Ukraine no. from becoming independent, or in no. any way hamper Ukraine's independence, or do anything no. to, to get in the way of Ukraine's independence? No. No, for many, many years after, there was no conflict between the two at all. Do you think Putin, if he was in charge at the time, would have allowed that to happen? I don't think so. He wouldn't have had any choice. Well, I'm not sure about that. You see, I you're talking about, I yeah, I don't I'm like not, Yeltsin. I'm not but... going to go into this you know, theorising about what you know, Putin supposedly wanted to re establish the Soviet Union. If you want to believe that, you can. I don't know. I don't. Have... No, I don't. Okay. I think I don't he think... wants the Russian Empire. Well, well, I don't think he wants the Russian Empire. It's, it's not. Ukraine is an independent country. The country which began. Um, uh, arming and equipping and giving military advice to Ukraine from 1991 was which country? When did American, when did American, I've told you the answer to this, when did American military aid to Ukraine begin? The moment it became independent. Okay. 1991. And a quid pro quo the was nuclear became, disarmament in 1904. No, Ukraine never had nuclear weapons. They did. No, Ukraine had on its territory nuclear weapons belonging to the Soviet Union. It had nuclear weapons in the sense that Britain had had um, had the American uh, the American missiles stationed in, in, in Holy Lock. There were no the Ukraine never had and never had control over the over Soviet nuclear weapons. Uh, it never had the launch codes, and it wasn't able to secure them. The, it's a fantasy. Anyone that covered Stalin makes the, the same. The reason I don't accept fatuous argument. Ukraine was never a nuclear okay. power and didn't give up being a nuclear yeah, the, power. The reason, just quite but it, the, 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 to the extent that it's at all relevant to the point, uh, but I, I, I have to correct this factually. The within. Months of Ukraine becoming independent it began to receive a, a right. American advice and aid. Okay, for why? Well, I, I mean, look, I don't. I'm not. I'm not an apologist for U.S. foreign policy, so I'm probably the wrong person no, I'm to, saying, to, I'm to, to interrogate you're, 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 you're the person who says there's been yeah, no. Extent, you're the person who says there's been no provocation. No, I mean, if if Scotland successfully achieved independence, say in September this year, if they managed to hold the second referendum and, and the independent side won it. And immediately, Chinese military advisors arrived in Glasgow. What do you think the response would be in London? I mean... What do you think we'd say? But, what do you think we'd do? But I think 
the reason. I mean, even in, in the, 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 the absolutely no doubt the reason that, 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 that the a, government, a government in London, if Scotland declared independence, would say, "Okay, this is your wish." I hope they'd be as nice about it as possible. They certainly wouldn't say, "Right, we're coming for you." Uh, well, no, if, no, nor, nor would there be any hostility. But if immediately, yeah, sure. But after, if, a, peace, if any... after a peaceful departure, right. obtained by a referendum, the a neighbouring country begins to accept military advice from a from a from a distant foreign power. It begins to it begins to start people. Wondering what's going on. Have you, Peter, are, are you, Peter, are you familiar quickly... with Zbigniew Brzezinski's book, The Grand Chessboard? Okay. And his theory of the importance of Ukraine? Yes, I, I, I know that I've not. You know how he, how he, he views Ukraine as being strategically just, the most important. Just on this, can I, can I just respond? Sorry, you just made guys, such so. a long point there in many different sub okay. Now You make some long points if, as well. True. If there were Chinese military advisers, if, if Scotland, an independent Scotland, moved into the Chinese military orbit, there's no question that would receive a hostile reaction from the Westminster government. Yeah. If the Westminster government then responded by invading Scotland and wiping out, Ab Ab listen, wiping out Aberdeen, there would be nothing more to say this, on that other than that is a monstrous, unprovoked, unprovoked yes, invasion. Yes, but you see, I'm not. First of all, I'm not arguing that, uh, as, you, as you've rightly, but I don't regard that as, 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 you right, as you've rightly pointed out. I'm not arguing that the, 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 the Russian invasion was justified or right. No. I am saying it was provoked. And I'm saying it was provoked over a very long period of repeated, uh, of, of, of repeated, in my view, stupidity. If you ignore someone with the intelligence and experience of George Kennan, no, then you're stupid. It's, it's appeal to authority now. Again, look, just... It's not an appeal to authority. It's, I, an, it's an appeal to experience. Peter, and it's also, the, it's an appeal to fact. The point, it, the, a, the point you, I wanted to... Be, listen, please let me let, let just yeah. make this point so you can engage with it. I'm not, I if, want to be clear what it is we're arguing about. Yeah, of course. But if you listen to what Putin or Medvedev or all the other senior Russian officials around them are saying, they are making very, very clear that this is about greater Russian nationalism. They talked about deep... You speak Russian? Deep, no, but I've read the translations, which I, I, I presume are not being fabricated. Not deep, fabricated, deep, No, listen, de ukrainization Putin's speech on the eve of the invasion yeah. of Ukraine, yeah. where he ranted about Vladimir Lenin for creating the entity of Ukraine and how it wasn't a legitimate entity. The whole basis, the rhetoric of the Russian regime is that Ukraine is not a legitimate political entity. Where does he say that? That it doesn't have... That's where, what he where, said in that. That's where, what he where, said in his where, speech. Where did he say it? What is the quotation? Oh, well, do you want me to bring up... Yeah, I do, because people oh keep telling word. me this. OK. Where, where did Putin, Putin say Putin Ukraine, was, Ukraine is not a legitimate country? He said, Putin's speech, eve of invasion. This is ludicrous. Oh, that I'm I'll start with the fact that modern Ukraine was entirely created by Russia, more precisely Bolshevik Communist Russia. This process began almost immediately after the revolution of 1917, and Lenin and his associates did it in a very rude way towards Russia itself, by separating, tearing away from it part of his own historical territories. Of course, no one asked about anything to the millions of people who lived here. Then on the even after the Great Patriotic War, Stalin already annexed the USSR and pre transferred to Ukraine some lands that previously belonged to Poland, Romania and Hungary. At the same time, as a kind of compensation, Stalin endowed Poland with part of the original German territories, and 1955 Khrushchev, for some reason, took away Crimea from Russia and gave it also to Ukraine. Actually, this is how the territory of Soviet Ukraine was formed. As a result of the Bolshevik policy, Soviet Ukraine arose, which even today can with good name reason be called Ukraine named after Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. He is its author and architect. This is fully confirmed by archival documents, including Lenin's harsh direct in the Donbass, which was literally squeezed into Ukraine. And now grateful descendants have demolished monuments to Lenin in Ukraine. The point he is making there is Ukraine is not a legitimate, it's not a legitimate. He doesn't say that. He, you can't Find, you can't find the words there because he didn't say them. Right. A, there is a long and complicated argument about the nature of the of what was the Soviet Republic but of all Ukraine. All countries are arbitrary. No, fine. I mean, all there, is a, there, are is arbitrary. A, there is a long and complicated argument about that because it, because, because if you were trying to design a country to, to function independently as Ukraine, nobody would choose the borders which Ukraine has. But it, it's not. He's not at any point saying Ukraine is not a legitimate country. People constantly say this. The words are not there. When, why the does words are not there. So, okay, does, I, what, any, any, what does, any, any more than Jim Callahan said, crisis, what crisis? He didn't say that. What? People are constantly telling me he said it. Argue about what he actually does say, which is a, a, a much more complicated. What does Medvedev, the former prime minister and the stooge president of Putin, when he talks about de what do you think he's talking about? I don't know. 
Oh, come on. I don't know. Come on now. Dehumanisation is just... Look, it, it, is it most extreme? It's genocide or rhetoric. Let's just be brutally honest about it. If you say, we're going to de Britain, what, what, what are we talking what's about the, what, What's the context? What's he, what, what's he, what, he, what's he, he said, saying? I'll bring it up if you want. Do you, again, we can bring up these quotes. I think... No, no, we, I'm not... We, we I'm not, have a different have, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not contesting it. I just, I just don't know. I just don't we, know this... We, uh, we have a different... I, I just, no, I just don't know what it is you're referring to. I'm asking you what he actually said. Okay. If you, if you tell me what he actually said, the word by itself doesn't tell me much. Well... So he says, well, he talks as well. He said, deep Ukrainization is a fictional concept fueled by anti-Russian poison and an all-consuming lie about its identity is one big fake. This phenomenon has never happened in history and now it doesn't exist. Ukraine, he said, will suffer its own fate, having tra mentally transformed into the Third Reich. Having written down the names of Jews and Nazi henchmen to history books, there, there she is, di there she is, dear, such Ukraine. Ukraine, Russia's most important well, goal is to change he, the bloody and full, to, he, full of false myths. He seems there to be denouncing de-Ukrainization as something he, he doesn't accept. No, no, he, no he's a deep Ukrainization. He's talking about how Ukraini Ukrainian... Oh, I thought, I thought you... you he talked about de-Ukrainization de as well to, de to reverse that process. Okay, well, I don't know about that. I mean, it seems to me to be a, a, a diversion from the point. Well, no, but I'm saying the rhetoric the of the Russian regime is hostility to the very concept argue, of Ukraine as a nation. What are we arguing about? We're, we're arguing about. I'm arguing about when did this war start? I'm was saying it, Russia's war aims are driven this, by provocation. When did, when did this war start? What is it about? Right. And uh, and if you like, if you're if, if you're interested in discussing whether uh, whether this country should be involved in arming Ukraine, uh, then what is our interest in doing so? That's what you, that's what I'm arguing. I'm saying it was unquestionably provoked, and I don't. I think the uh, the the admission of Robert Kagan of this is is uh, is, is absolute. If if someone on that side admits it, even if you don't accept George Kennan's protests, uh, and if you don't accept Jack Matlock's def description of the events of 2014 as a putsch, even if you don't accept that, uh, and if you don't if you don't see any um, any any worrying nature in George W. Bush's behavior in Bucharest in 2008. It, it, if you don't, it, even then, you still have to accept that there is a, a serious argument that this action was... I oppose NATO expansion. No, but was, I oppose NATO expansion. The point, okay, well, like, well, uh, what, but the point I'm making is, I understand why Eastern Europeans have a different perspective to me, because an Eastern European will tell me, and have, I've, been, I've been told off by people in Eastern Europe for being tone deaf on this particular issue, is they will say to me, it's easy for you to make this argument, but you haven't lived under the shadow of Russia in various different incarnations, which sees Eastern and Central Europe I'm, I'm, as its favorite. I'm not influence. unfamiliar with Eastern Europe myself. I know, I'm not trying to patronize you, I'm just trying to explain what I Eastern Europeans have told well, me. Well, I'm not unfamiliar, but I, the, 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 the truth is that the, 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 first, um, the first of the former Soviet control areas to become NATO members were Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. Yeah. In, in what year did they do so? What, they, what, 1990, wasn't it? When yeah. they became independent. I mean, they were annexed I by think, Stalin, think, to be I fair. Think, well, I, yes. Um, they, but that's not the point. The point is, I think it's, I think there were 13 years between their declarations of independence and their, I have to check this, but certainly a very lo long period between their declarations of independence and their accession to NATO. Yeah, it was a long. Well, period. during that time, uh, were they threatened with, uh, with 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 Russian takeover? In well, you've got senior. You've got certainly on Russian state television pundits talking about how they need to go into the Baltic states and even attack Poland. Well, maybe you have, but I'm not asking you that. I'm asking you: was there any serious suggestion that the, that, they, that their sovereignty was under threat? The answer is no. Well, Putin's, you can say he's, yeah, got, he's yeah, invaded yeah, in Georgia. Georgia, as the Tagliavini report clearly shows, uh, Georgia provoked that uh, provoked that event by, by by making the attack. It was Georgian shelling that began that attack. There isn't any question. This is a European Union Commission report. And it says so, and it just, just it, it, it was it was started by Georgia, and there are interesting arguments about why that should have been, but it was. Just finally on Ukraine, how do you think the war? What? How do you see a last? Because we, at the end of the day, there has to be some sort of settlement. There's, it's an inevitability of sort of that's how war. We has haven't to end. really got anywhere on 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 whose fault it is. 
Well, uh, I, I, what the real reason is for it, or um, well, I just or, I don't, or, what, or what Britain's interest. I, I think Russia. I think Russian war aims are driven by greater Russian chauvinism and nationalism. Well, I, I don't think, think they're I think, driven. I, by I, think, I, think, I think you have. You, have you, you can think that as much as you like. You haven't produced any evidence for it. I think. I think that Putin speech. We have obviously a very different interpretation. I've seen a lot of people telling me what the Putin speech meant. Uh, Why but, do you think he's talking about Lenin not being a legitimate entity? If I challenge you, because he's because I mean, Putin is a is a is not some great intellectual historian. No. But he 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 likes to talk about history. He does. He's a long disquisition. What he's basically doing is explaining that the current shape of Ukraine, the shape of Ukraine in which it became independent in 1991, was was as far as I recall, he actually used it the phrase was was the the result of the the actions of the. Um, the, the, of the Central Committee of the Soviet Communist Party, a body for which he and nobody else has any has any lingering respect. It was a very awkward shaped country in which to, uh, it, 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 in which to seek independence. And here is a thing which you won't like to know, uh, but we've discussed how Ukraine left uh, the, the power of Moscow through a referendum which was respected by Moscow in 1991. In 1992, the people of Crimea tried under the Ukrainian constitution lawfully to hold a referendum on the status of Crimea, in which it was certain they would have voted to leave Ukraine if they'd been given the chance, and they were, they were, they, they were forced to cancel it under threats of violence from Kiev. So it's okay, in the it's okay for Ukraine to leave Russia under a referendum and for, to mean, and, and, and for Russia to say, fine, you go. And Russia is still condemned as a dreaming hold imperial on, power. Hold on. In, uh, but if, if, if Crimea wishes to leave Ukraine, as Ukraine left the power of Russia, then Ukraine prevents Crimea from doing so. This is a historical fact. But, but can I just, in 1991, in the referendum for Ukrainian independence, 55% of the people of Crimea voted for independence. Well, it's a complicated thing. What they were actually voting, they voted for independence from the Soviet Union. And the, the issue of the referendum was partly to do with the Soviet Union. I don't think there's any doubt at all. I, huge numbers of people signed a petition in in, 90, in early '92 asking for a, a very large. Well, I'm not surprised. Forty-five percent of them opposed independence. Sorry. So well, forty-five percent. Fine. For, it's like the Remain. No, it's like Remain. No, you could say you, you could say Remain is positioned like against Ukraine. Forty-eight percent. Ukraine of them, right? in 1992. Have you got that? I'm referring to 1992. Yes, I have, but that's not that long. Thirty years. Thirty years ago. Yeah, but it's not this that is, long after the referendum in 1991, in which they voted I, I, for independence. If, but if, if Ukraine was so confident that the majority of the Crimean people were going to vote to stay in Ukraine, why did they prevent the referendum from taking place? Well, you could say which why, they did, you not could, lawfully. But with, but with threats of violence. Why did Theresa May stop another referendum on Brexit, it's given a, you had all these marches and petitions it's a good by question. Remainers? It's a good question, I but there it is. Um, I don't, but it's, it's not the one I'm asking. Well, no, I'm just saying look, the losing side in a the referendum point, often the then try I, and want point, another referendum. The point That's that I'm making is that, the, is, that the, is that Ukraine in the shape in which it became, became independent in 1991 was not ideally designed. It's not unreasonable to say so, particularly the Khrushchev transfer of Crimea to Ukraine in 1954. If Ukraine isn't armed by Western powers, what would happen to Ukraine, do you think, in the current context? Well, if Ukraine stayed out of, uh, stayed out of Western, Western alliances, nothing would have happened. Do you think now if Ukraine say we won't join NATO ever again, the war would just end? We, sorry, we'll never join NATO. Well, NATO, is, NATO isn't, isn't necessarily the point. I mean, NATO, NATO membership doesn't... Uh, doesn't prevent a NATO member from, from intervening in the war in Ukraine. Britain is not, by its adherence to NATO, prevented from sending troops to fight in Ukraine or declaring war on Russia, nor is the United States. This is a fantasy that, that, that NATO membership actually prevents us from doing these things. The reason why Britain and the United States and France and Germany and all the other NATO members are not doing this is not because Ukraine isn't in NATO, it's because they don't want to. If they wanted to, they have the sovereign power. In fact, the NATO treaty itself is so vague can, just, that it wouldn't can compel I get, just, them to, if, 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 if Ukraine were a NATO Pete, member. Pete, just a straightforward question. Article 5 if, is greatly overrated. If, if arms, military arms now, yeah. were not given to Ukraine, what do you think would happen to Ukraine now. in the context? If all arms stop like now, this second, what would happen to Ukraine? Do you think? I don't know. Would you, I have, the Russians not, would just I'm march not, all the way not, through, not, not a military expert. Well, they take Kiev, wouldn't they? I don't know. Do they want to take it? 
Well, I think originally they wanted a lightning strike in Kiev. That was their, I mean, they just went into butcher, murdered huge numbers of innocent people, uh, put them in mass graves, raped people. So we know that. I mean, the, the, the war is horrible, and yeah. if you don't like atrocities, don't have them. But I don't. I'm not. You know, I'm not defending the war, nor am I defending the invasion. No, but I'm saying they what wanted to take Kiev. What I'm saying is, I don't know what the objectives. Why did they have a convoy go to I Kiev? I don't know. Well, because they wanted to I take. Don't know. They wanted to take. Kiev. I don't know. You don't send a military convoy on the way to a capital unless you want to take the capital. Are you? Have you? Have you? Have you done the the, the Camberley staff course? Are you? Are you expert in in, in land warfare? Because I'm not. I, I don't know why I, they I, did you it. You don't have to be an expert in military warfare to know that if you're sending a massive armed convoy on the way to a city, you probably plan to take the city. Otherwise, why would you waste all that resources? There are just arguments, to, just to go but I don't, I don't the know. I don't, what, the, the, the question then you have to ask is why they didn't do it. But it's not. Um, it, it, it's 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 not of any interest. What is the purpose of this invasion? Well, they're going to annex large parts of Eastern Europe uh, of Eastern Ukraine to Russia. Well, they right? might. I mean, they might. They might. Including they, Maripol. They're going to do what they did in Gorzny. They might do that. Yes. But uh, do, do you do you actually think the intention was to seize Ukraine and in, 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 in invade it and in sort of impose a puppet, impose well, a puppet may be right, But I have no way of knowing that. I've never seen the objectives of the operation announced. Just finally, again. lots of people telling me what they were. I don't know what, but I, I don't I don't know. I'm not. It's it's how, not. How I, do I, you I, think I'm this not a. I, I, I make no claims to you. I've never even been in the combined cadet force. I have no knowledge of military tactics or strategy. What What do you think? I couldn't even dismantle a rifle. What do you think the likely outcome of this war would be? And do you think there could be a lasting settlement? Which will well, prevent it could be. There was a lasting settlement available before it started in Minsk too. Which was, uh, but the United States particularly wouldn't put any, any force behind it. So it, it, it never came to be. Either you could have a settlement tomorrow if there was a desire for a settlement. But I strongly suspect there are certainly elements in the United States who want a long war. And it may well be uh, that the Russian response will be okay if you want a long war, you can have one. Do you think the likely outcome of this in terms of the decline of Western power, the context of the decline of Western power? Because the reason, as I mentioned Kissinger before, he's, his concerns about the Ukraine conflict is for people like Kissinger, the main strategic rival to the United States is China, and the lasting outcome. There is something in what he says, isn't well, there? Well, the lasting outcome is likely to be Russia ever more firmly as a junior partner um, in the bloc. Because the whole point of Nixon going to China, of course, was to divide uh, the Soviet but, Union but in, and China. In those so days, the Soviet it, Union was a, was a global military. Mm -hmm. And Russia is in an enfeebled state. political power. And Russia, Russia is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a rust heap with the gross domestic product the size of Italy. Yeah, with a much bigger population, so per capita much lower, yeah. So do you think that's the likely outcome of all of this, actually, for the West, is bad news because, for Western strategic interests, because it will mean a power block led by China, maybe even India. I mean, India and China historically have had rivalries, but they've moved closer together. See, I have no idea. I, but what I can say is I can see no sense in this. Uh, if you were, if, if uh, the United States or Britain or Russia were trying to run intelligent, self-interested foreign policy, I can see no sense in anything that any of them have been doing for the past several months. It's all stupid. But the problem is, that any reading of history, you will find that most people behave stupidly most of the time, so that's nothing new. But it's stupid. What is the point of it? What does the United States gain? What does Europe gain? What does Ukraine gain? What does Russia gain? What does Britain gain? Nothing. It's just piles of corpses. Yeah. Right now, Tens of thousands of corpses and millions of refugees who were formerly happy, contented human beings. What was the point of that? Very, very strongly agree with that. Just but fine. it was provoked, and it was, and, and, I, and I'm afraid that the people who provoked it, whether it, it, it doesn't matter whether you, what you think about the rightness or wrongness of the Russian action. I think, to me, it was one of the worst pieces of news I've ever heard in my life. Uh, it, it's so wrong and stupid, was it? But there it was. Whatever you think of it, nonetheless, those who provoked it have to have to take some responsibility for it. Finally, we've covered lots of ground, so let's try and wrap up. On a, well, I, I would say try and do an optimistic note, but I, I, I'm 
I've rarely heard you say anything optimistic on your own terms. You're not. You really say? I was going to try and end on on an optimistic note, but I have to say no, you're I not. Don't, I don't. Optimi- you're not one of life's natural optimists. Is what I'm saying. Optimism trying to say. is for fools. Okay, well there we go. Optimism so I was going to ask, it's what it's does, a, does the secret of happiness is personal? Because if I was going to say, if someone's going to ask me what gives me hope, because I think these are, from my own perspective, very politically bleak times. Uh, but what gives me hope, I always think, are, are younger people who I think are have have suffered tremendously over the last 15 years, austerity has disproportionately affected them. The pandemic, we don't agree with the response, but they suffered the terrible consequences um, because they formed a cordon sanitaire amongst the elderly population. They give me hope because politically, I think they're the most progressive generation we've ever had. That gives me hope. What gives you hope? Oh, all my hopes are religious. I have no, I, I, I have no material So the next life? Political hopes. Well, it, for, no, for eternity. There is, I mean, for instance, you and I both desire, I'm absolutely certain, uh, desire justice very, very strongly. Uh, we have it within us as an almost um, burning, fiery furnace. Yeah, they something so, yeah. absolutely desired. Yeah. And also both of us know that in this life we will not see justice. I don't give up on that, actually, but fine. It won't happen. I disagree. But so therefore the only place in which I can see the possibility of justice is eternity. So that's what I stick to. History turns on a sixpence. Things can change very, very quickly if you look throughout history, very dramatically. Oh, yes, they Often can, the yes, worst. as you say. <laughs> on, that, on that optimistic note, Peter, it's been a pleasure as ever. <laughs> <laughs>